Leave my freaking shirt alone. Is that what it is? I got it for... I put it on just because of Alicia. Now I'm hot. Alicia, you do not know what I am doing for you. <laughs> just because you like purple. Oh, she's a sweetheart. She is. She's my sister. Right. You leave her alone. I'm, Hush up. I will. I'll be good. Well, see how this works out. <laughs> All right. We're watching two youngins, so we'll give this a shot. See how it comes out. Again. Hello, dear brothers and sisters chosen by the happy God. Looking into the, into BibleStudyTools.com, we find an interesting article by John Rutherford, which says in part concerning the barrier in the temple in which we edited part of it for our study here because this is needed for us to see how Paul was used to bring us the evangel and the struggles he went through in doing so. Uh, Paul went through a lot of stuff. John writes... What Paul here asserts is that Christ is our peace, the peace of both Jewish and Gentile believers. He made them both to be one in himself and has broken down the middle wall of partition which divided them from one another. <coughs> then the apostle regards Jew and Gentile as two, but by a fresh act of creation in Christ are made into one new humanity. New man. Yes. In the former of these similes, he refers to the actual wall in the temple at Jerusalem, beyond which no one is allowed to pass unless he were a Jew. It was this barrier which marked the limit up to which a Gentile might advance, but no further. Curiously, this middle wall of partition had a great deal to do with Paul's arrest and imprisonment. For the multitude of the Jews became infuriated not merely because of their general hostility to him as an apostle of Christ and a preacher of the gospel for the world, but especially because it was erroneously supposed that he had brought Trophimus, Trophimus. the Ephesian, past this barrier into the temple. As we see in Acts 21-29, for before this, Trophimus, the Ephesian, was seen in the city with him, whom they inferred that Paul led into the sanctuary and that he had in this manner profaned the temple as it is pointed out here in Acts 24 6 who tries to profane the sanctuary also of whom we laid hold also yeah. that just doesn't make sense though they grabbed a hold of they held them well I know I know but that's the way they talked back then well they can untalk <laughs> hard to hard to read it sometimes Looking back, back in Acts 21, verse 26 through 28, we read, Then Paul, taking the men along on the next day, being purified together with them, had been in the sanctuary, publishing the full comp completion of the days of purification, till the approach present for them, for each one of them was offered. Now, as the seven days were about to be concluding, Jews from the providence of Asia gazing at him in the sanctuary through the entire throng into confusions and laid hands upon him crying men israelites help this is a man who is teaching all men everywhere against the people and the law and this holy place besides still more he led greeks into greeks also into the sanctuary and has contaminated this holy place can you imagine the, how upset them people was <laughs> Imagine how stupid they were. To throw that out. He had brought Greeks into the temple and polluted this holy place. And the assault which they had thereupon made on Paul, they violently seized and dragged him out of the temple outside the barrier. The Levites, Levites at once shut the gates to prevent the possibility of any further prof, profanication. Profanation. Or pro whatever it is it is. contamination yeah <laughs> and Paul would have been torn in pieces had not the Roman co commander and his soldiers forcibly prevented it looking into the court of the Gentiles we see the court formed the lowest and the outer most enclosure of all the courts of the sanctuary it was paved with the finest variegated variegated marble its name signifies that it was open to all, Jews or Gentiles alike. It was very large and is said by Jewish tradition to have 
been have formed a square of 750 foot. It was in this courtyard that the oxen and sheep and droves for the sacrifices doves. were sold. Oh, doves, for the sacrifices were sold as in a market. It is was in this court too that there were tables of money changers which Christ Himself had overthrew when He drove out the sheep and oxen and them that bought and sold in his father's house. The multitudes assembling in this court must have been very great, especially on occasions such as the Passover and Pentecost and at the other great feasts. And the den of voices must have been most disturbing. As already seen, beyond this court, no Gentile might go. Concerning the temple, in the year 1871, during the excavation made on the site of the temple, it was discovered that one of the pillars now preserved in the Museum of Constantinople is inscribed with a Greek inscription in capital or unical letters, which is translated as Father. As follows. As follows. It says, No man on of another nation to enter within the fence and enclosure round the temple and whoever is caught will have himself to blame that his death ensues. While Paul was writing the Ecclesia, the, good grief. <laughs> it's all right. When Paul was writing the epistle to the Ephesians at Rome, this barrier in the temple of Jerusalem was still standing. Yet the chain prisoner of Jesus Christ was not afraid to write that Christ had broken down the middle wall of the partition and had thus admitted Gentiles who were far off access to God, which in ancient times was possessed only by Israel. That separation between Jew and Gentile was done away with forever in Christ. This is brought out in Ephesians 2.14, which was covered in our previous studies. Yeah, to read this article in its entirety, go to the website, uh, BibleStudyTools.com, and, and, and it's in there. Uh, and interesting, Rob uploaded a video today uh, that compared the temple to the Noah's Ark. And <laughs> that's an eye-opener to see this. Uh, that gentleman does a, a very good study on that, and it's amazing what he's brought out. Our brother, Chris Carnahan, says he finds the study concerning the central wall fascinating. He pointed out that in Romans, the references to the joint allotment is during the Acts period, where the Jew is still first in Romans 1.16 and where there was much advantage to being a Jew in Romans 3 verses 1 and 2. And in Colossians 3.11, the joint body has no distinction. He, he loves when the Father turned, on, turned the lights on to this difference. So let's look at these references to Ephesians 2.17 and see how they come together. And coming... He brings the evangel of peace to you, those afar, and peace to those near. It was in Romans 5, verses 1 and 2. Being then justified by faith, we may be having peace toward God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have the excess also by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we may be glory and expectation of the glory of God. Yet all is up... Oh, this... 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 21. You always have that way up there. Or I can't ever see it. Sorry, we'll fix that. Yet all is of God who conciliates, conciliates us to himself through Christ and is giving us the dispensation of the conciliation. How that God was in Christ conciliating the world to himself, yeah. not reckoning their offenses to them and placing in us the word of of the conciliation. That's in us. We we do that. For Christ then are we ambassadors, as of God entreating through us. We are beseeching for Christ's sake, be conciliated to God. For he for the one not knowing sin, he makes to be a sin offering for our sakes, that we may be becoming God's righteousness in him. Ephesians two, eleven through twenty two. Oh Wherefore remember that once you, the nations in Christ, who were termed uncircumcised in flesh, who were termed uncircumcised, wherefore, remember that once you, the nations in flesh, who were termed uncircumcision by those termed circumcision in flesh, made by hands, that you were in that area apart from Christ, 
being alienated from the citizenship of Israel and guests of the promised covenant, having no expectation and without God in the world. Yet now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off are become near by the blood of Christ. Mm -hmm. For he is our peace, who makes both one and rises the central wall of the barrier, the enmity in his flesh, nullifying the law of precepts that he should be creating the two in himself into one new humanity, Taking. making peace. And should be reconciling both in one body to God through the cross, killing the enmity in it. I know. And coming, he brings the evangel of peace to you, those afar, and peace to those near. For I know. <laughs> Sorry. Where are we at? Uh, okay, we're talking about the blood of Christ being our peace, who makes both one and raises the central wall of the barrier, right? We're going to have to stop this right here and, and come back to we'll visit give a this pause. just a second. I don't know where we were, right. so we're going to start we don't know over again. where we was at. Let's go back up here to verse 14. We're reading out of, we're here in Ephesians 2, 11 through 22. And we made it down about the blood of Christ. I remember that. For, for he is our peace, who makes both one, and rises the center wall of the barrier, the enmity in his flesh, nullifying the law of precepts and decrees, that he should be creating the two in himself into one humanity, making peace, and should be reconciling both in one body to God through the cross, killing the enmity in it. And coming, he brings the evangel of peace to you, those afar, and peace to those near. For through him we we have both have the access in one spirit to the Father. Consequently then, no longer are you guests and sojourners, but are fellow citizens of the saints and belong to God's family, being built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, the capstone of the corner being Christ Jesus himself, in whom the entire building being connected together is growing into the holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for God's dwelling place yeah. in spirit. Yep, that's amazing. Uh, Dean Huff wrote this beautiful article about the evangelical peace and unsearchable riches in, in volume 79. He writes, Joy and peace characterize Paul's evangel from start to finish. Yeah. Go. Oh. Oh. He always begins and closes every letter with some mention of grace, which has its root meaning joy. And he joins it with the word peace in his opening salutation. Sickness and failure bring a bleakness into the lives of many of us, especially as we grow older. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. Yeah, we find... <laughs> We find joy and peace in knowing that our realm is inherent in the heavens, <laughs> out of which we are awaiting a Savior also, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transfigure the body of our humiliation to conform it to the body of His glory and accord the operation which enables Him even to subject all to Himself. In Philippians 3, 20 and 21. All of Paul's epistles are characterized by these blessings and they could be strung together to explain the source of our source of our joy and peace. <laughs> Listen to this little voice singing over here. That sounds awesome. I like little voices. <laughs> They're so cool. The faith which we have is that God is working so that we rely on the living God who saves us in his grace because of the sacrifice of Christ and not because of our own righteousness. Praise God for his joy and peace. Looking into scripture, we find this encouragement in Colossians 2, 12 through 17. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy, beloved, pitiful compassions, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another and dealing graciously among ourselves, among yourselves. If anyone should be having a 
complaint against any. According as the Lord also deals graciously with you, thus also you. Yeah. Now, over all these, put on love, which is the tie of maturity. And let the peace of Christ be arbitrating in your hearts, for which you were called also in one body, and become thankful. Let the word of Christ be making its home in you richly, all in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing yourselves in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to God. Yeah, and everything, whatsoever you may be doing, in word or in act, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to the Father through him. We love you all. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the references we had in the study we put together for uh, Ephesians 2, verse 17. Is that where we're at? Yes. Is that what it was? So anyway, that was pretty neat. But watch if you Rob. didn't put all the scriptures in there, you wouldn't have a problem remembering. Oh, I know. If, Alicia. We get, in, if we get into Ephesians, and it's awesome. But anyway. Mike. Uh, check Sterling, out. Sterling. Judy. <laughs> <laughs> we get into this like, woohoo. But watch Rob Wiles' video. Look him up. And uh, I don't remember the name of it. But this, uh, anyway, whatever it is. Um, he compares this with uh, uh, Noah's Ark, and there's something in it. It's amazing it what you find. It is totally confusing to me. Yeah, it's deep. It's really deep, and a lot of, a lot of truth in it. So, anyway, there's our study today. Sorry, you, we had to <laughs> do this in two. I had popcorn in the belly button, yep. a bag of popcorn thrown over the top of us, yep. and then. Two of them fighting. Fighting going on, so we had to stop it and start all over. So Papa yelled. They've been on notice over there now. <laughs> Y'all better watch it. I got my eye on you. So anyway, that's life. And uh, and we had to separate them. Yeah, we had to separate them. Because Colton kept putting his toe on Remington's <laughs> nose. Well, he had it in his mouth at one time. His, his toe. Looked over and he's gnawing on his toe now. I'm like, what the heck? Well, he put it on <laughs> her kidding. nose. She didn't want his toe on no. her nose. Woo. Ah, kids. They're flexible. Never a dull <laughs> moment. But we're thankful to be able to come and present this stuff with you guys. Yeah. And to bring it out in the fashion that we do. Uh, our home is lived in and, and we enjoy it. Man, There's we love it. Sometimes when we like for them to be quiet, but. Uh, it's hard to hard to get these put together. So we love you guys, and it's time to go see what God's got for us. Yes. Anything you need to say? I love you guys. Yeah. At least I only give you a hard time because I love you. Yeah, we do. We love you guys. So grace and peace, much love. And we'll catch you all uh, tomorrow. Don't so, say I've it. I've got that. It'll be late. I got. We got to leave. Be there by eleven tomorrow. Yeah, it's gonna be late tomorrow. So either we do it early in the morning or we'll do it after we get back. But we'll get one out tomorrow. So <laughs> we'll see you all then.